Greetings, everyone. Welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. For those of you wondering who's behind the mic, hi, I'm him. Some of you have had questions about your membership status. When the channel was demonetized, YouTube booted a few members. I don't know how it happened. So I've also spoken with them, YouTube support, and they've just advised that if you were a member and you don't have your membership privileges uh, back, go ahead and re-sign up again. Cool? If you have any questions, please email me at back to ashes the number two at gmail.com. For those of you that are new to the channel, or for those of you sitting in the back row and haven't done so already, if you enjoy what you are hearing, please don't forget to subscribe, like, share, and comment. Not only does it help this channel out, but it also reminds you of every time I upload a video. With that being said, it is time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person in the morning. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in to get warm, and prepare for your dose of vocal melatonin. Entitled, Let's Not Meet. Right after this intro and ad will play, I'll read the first story and ad will play, and after that there will be no more ads within this video. Disclaimer. These videos are for educational and entertainment purposes only. Let's begin. Hello guys. So, we went for a hike with my boyfriend for his birthday today. We're not very superstitious people, but we were quite anxious the whole time. We didn't meet anyone on the road, and I was feeling very weird. Like I was thinking, I know we're going to meet someone. But that someone, I wasn't chill about it. My boyfriend was a bit nervous, which is unusual for him, as he's very used to going hiking pretty much anywhere. Alright, so we were four plus hours into the hike, and we reached almost the end. There was some sort of cabin in the forest and a guy looking like Tom Hanks in Castaway, I swear to God on that, was there. He jumped out of his cabin naked, holding a knife, and began making grunts. I told my boyfriend he has a knife and the guy starts to run towards us. My boyfriend told me to run, go, and I tried to do my best as I'm not the most sporty girl. I believe I fell a few times because I have a lot of scratches and a bump on the shin, but I didn't feel it at the moment. After what felt like forever to run to escape this man, we've succeeded to find a way out to a neighborhood and then a road. We felt so much relief at that moment. My question is, we feel in shock and pretty traumatized by this. Do you feel like it's a serious event or is it not that big of a deal? I know that it might sound stupid to ask, but we just don't know anymore. Maybe we're overreacting? We did report him to the police, by the way, and they were supposed to go at the place he stayed at. But we're not sure they are going to take their time for all of that. So, crazy man in the woods, let's not meet. Sorry in advance, I was drunk most of the time during what happened, so I don't remember every single detail. When I was 18 and freshly broken up with my way older boyfriend, I basically went crazy with dating guys. At the time, I also dressed very goth, even going as far as to wear a real corset and trench coat, mostly just enjoying the attention. One particular afternoon, my friend, or roommate at the time, decided to eat at a local Japanese restaurant with both of us all dressed up. Our waiter was a mediocre, skinny white guy who clearly was a little alternative, but it was hard to tell because of the uniform. We joked about me leaving my phone number on the receipt or something, so I hyped myself up and did so. Late that night, he had sent me a text. We talked for a few days, never really having a right time to meet up as I worked 40 minutes away from where I lived. 
He mentioned the boots he wore meant a lot to him and some other odd things that just seemed like edgy jokes. One really late night coming home, I was texting and driving, as my 18-year-old self does, and we decided to meet up. My stupid ass invited him over to my apartment, where it was just me and the roommate who had been with me before. Our other two roommates were not home. At first it was fine because I was already drunk, so I would just let him rant about whatever he wanted. He went on about his life, going to jail, medical bills, his parents, etc. Eventually he asked me if I wanted to see his tattoos, and I was like, all right, sure. He lifted up his shirt, and not only could I see the handgun tucked into his waistband, but also his multiple badly covered up Nazi tattoos. One was even just slightly covered by a banana. I don't know what it was, but I simply decided the best way to deal with the situation was to appease him, so I went along with it just casually. I don't remember exactly every detail because it was over two years ago, and I was drunk, mind you. But he ended up pulling his gun out and putting it to my head, asking me if I was scared. I was immensely confused and tried to call his bluff, saying I wasn't, which got him to put it away for a while. When we went to hook up in my messy-ass room, he pulled it on me again, saying he wanted to do it without it. I got mad and tried to fight him off of me and get it away from my head. Of course I wasn't as strong as him, and he hit me in the arm with it, which, that shit hurt because it was a nice one. When I finally got him off of me and he realized I was pissed, not scared, he started acting like a crackhead, saying I was crazy for not caring about him, pulling a gun on me. He ran off, jumping the fence of the apartment complex, and not even taking his car that he had came in. In the morning, his car was gone, and I had a large bruise from where he had hit me. While to me it's a funny story, I now realize how bad it could have ended up. So, to the waiter from the Japanese restaurant, I hope I never meet you again. Disclaimer, this next story involves domestic abuse. If you or someone that you love are going through the same situation, please dial 911 or 999 or whatever your emergency service line is and make sure to get somewhere safe. I was just a sophomore in high school and I fell head over heels for the new quiet kid and thought he was my forever. Crazy, but I would actually go on marrying him down the road just one week after graduation. High school sweethearts. Ha. Looking back now, I can see how many red flags I noticed, but ignored because I was a young, eagerly wanting to be a grown-up. Fast forward. The night before my wedding day, I was going over last-minute wedding details with my mom, who was easily one of the most caring and selfless people I know. So... Bless my sweet mama's heart when I asked her if she'd be mad if I decided I didn't want to go through with the wedding. Wedding was the next day, by the way. But, me being me, mom thought I was just messing with her. I couldn't tell her the truth of what was going on now, so I took a deep breath and forced a believable chuckle. She genuinely thought I was just pulling another one of my jokes. I went on to finally tell her almost a year after I escaped him, and she still feels bad for not taking it seriously. No one knew what was going on behind closed doors, but it makes sense. I was honestly his biggest PR team. Only two hours passed since saying I do's. He was throwing me out of the truck in my parents' driveway, cussing and yelling that he wanted a divorce, recklessly driving off so much for all of that honeymoon phase on our actual honeymoon. I ran inside and my dad came out of the bedroom and he can't understand a word I'm saying but he is trying to basically ask me what had happened. 
and I say it as clear as I could while uncontrollably sobbing. He left me. How could he? On our honeymoon. My dad is pissed, but then relaxed and tried to rationalize the situation. Like maybe he forgot something, pulling a bad joke or something like that. Then we see his truck flying into our driveway and my dad smiles and says, See, he's right there. I wipe my tears and walk out of the door and then tell them, Yes, it was a prank. Inside, I was screaming. I was so embarrassed for myself because now I look crazy. But if I wanted to save this relationship, they could never know the truth. Months go by and he starts being sweeter ever since we had to be long distance because he was in the military at training. But soon, I would be packing up my life and moving to Texas with him. I could tell my parents were starting to see the cracks I had worked so hard to glue together. My mom even picked up my phone on the table, mistaking it for hers, and saw this huge message from my ex and just started crying, begging me to stay because he was not a good person. But I assured her that this was way out of character for him and that he was just lonely. I knew she didn't believe me, but she also knew I was stubborn and was going to do whatever, regardless of her concerns. After just a few weeks in Texas, I knew my life was in danger. It was Thanksgiving Day, and my family just called to check up on us and just tell us Happy Thanksgiving, and after that, I hung up the phone. The man I thought was my soulmate started cussing at me and saying that I need to stop talking to my family because he was my family now. I let out a little chuckle, thinking he's got to be joking. And he picks up our wedding glasses, I specifically had made for us, and throws them directly at me, shattering all around me. Shocked, I didn't know what to do. So I walk over to the broom and start sweeping up the broken glass. You may be thinking that surely he would be done throwing a tantrum by now, but no. He then throws picture frames at me while I'm still sweeping up the glass. Honestly, that broken glass on the wood floor was just a metaphor for any love I had left towards this man. I broke that night. I stopped seeing him as my other half and more as the monster I'm now stuck with. I became very depressed and he seemed to love that. He would break me down over and over again just to get a reaction. Two months go by and one night he completely lost his shit over the washer and dryer people messing up the days they were supposed to come out and he started pacing back and forth mumbling words. I couldn't quite make out what he was saying, but demanded that I call and fix it. He grabbed me and set me on the couch telling me what to say and that I'd better not fuck it up. Like a damn negotiation. This man was paranoid as fuck, making comments that they were doing it because he was a soldier then started blaming me, even though I wasn't even around him when he first called in the first place, but still yelled at me for hours until, snap, he walked to the bedroom. Me? I'm on the couch still processing that fucking moment. He says, you're so fucking stupid. This is your fault. Did you plan this with the workers just to make me look dumb? Or are you really just that fucking dumb? Huh? You fucking bitch? Him again. That's what I fucking thought. You fucking no good ungrateful bitch. Me. You know what? I'm done. You won't do anything except complain and bitch at me. Blaming me for everything. All you do is cuss and yell at me for no damn reason. He looked at me with this look that I've heard other victims try and describe, and the best I can describe it is a darkness in his eyes, like an emptiness that still causes me nightmares to this day. Without hesitation, he lunges at me in the middle of the day, 
with our curtains open, doors wide open, neighbors out and about. He throws me against the wall and starts choking me. I slowly see black, but he lets me go for a second, because then he slammed my entire body to the floor. At that moment, I either blacked out or my brain was trying to shield myself from what was happening. But piece by piece, I would come to, and he was holding me by my shoulders and just repeatedly slamming me into the wooden floor. My screams ignored by the people outside. I pleaded for anyone to call the police and repeated yelling help over and over. My fight or flight takes over and chooses flight. I run to the main bathroom and lock the door, frantically calling my mom because in that moment I just wanted to hear her voice. Unsure if that would be my last. But my poor mom didn't know the nightmare of that phone call until it was too late. She was with my sister and dad and she put me on speakerphone because she usually does this so they can all talk to me like we were all there together. But instead, they hear me screaming for my life and hear my ex calling me awful names and telling me to get my ass in there and to unlock the door. They were confused and my dad was ready to come kill this asshole himself, but then silent. No more banging, just me softly crying and just trying to call my mother over the phone that I am all right and that I know I need to leave him, but that I had to do it in the safest way possible. Because if he were to catch me, I may not make it out with my life. When I walk out of the room, my ex is just sitting there with a blank stare, like nothing had happened. This was a theme throughout our three-year relationship, but I could no longer ignore the escalation of his behavior. So, one night, I put my escape plan into action. I was going to make a run for it. It was 2 a.m. Keys to my Pontiac were on the kitchen table, and he was asleep in the bedroom that I wasn't allowed in several days earlier. I busted out the guest bedroom that was my prison and beelined out the front door quietly, but also as quickly as possible. Nine and a half hours to my home state, only stopped once in Dallas to fill up on gas. With every mile in my rearview mirror, I felt something inside that reassured me. I am free now. Forever scarred, but most have healed or faded. I 100% believe, had I stayed, I'd be six feet deep. So, to my abusive ex-husband that I fled from that late February night, let's not ever meet again. Ever. So, last night I had a scary encounter with a pickup truck that chased me down a deserted road and a commenter asking me about whether this person followed me from the gas station reminded me of another incredibly creepy encounter I had when I was working and traveling in New York City. I worked in marketing at the time and was in Manhattan on a press tour for a tech client. Part of my job was always to invite the reporters and bloggers out for drinks after, and because many had become friends, and I was 28 at the time, we made a late night of it, and I didn't get back to my hotel until well after 2 a.m. When my taxi dropped me off, I stood outside the hotel and smoked a cigarette, checking my mail, Facebook, and the like because I never liked making eye contact it invites panhandlers. So I was completely engrossed in my phone and definitely beyond tipsy, but not paying any attention to who was around me. When I finished, I walked into the hotel lobby and was followed in by a man. I didn't make eye contact or look at his face, but he was substantially taller than me and as nondescript as they come, black wool coat, jeans, black shoes, shaggy hair, brown. Couldn't tell you what his face looked like, 
I pushed the button for the elevator and stepped in, followed by him. I pushed the button for my floor and the elevator did nothing. I remember then that I needed to swipe my room key to get the elevator to move, which, thank God, was lost somewhere in the depths of my purse. As I started fishing for it, my hazy brain asked, why hasn't he swiped his room key yet? So I tell him to go ahead. He says nothing and doesn't move. By this point, I have my hand on my room key, but I'm still pretending I can't find it waiting to see what this guy does. And he's still just standing there, watching the door, like to be sure no one else gets on. And I had this immediate panic that I had to get out of that elevator and to security before I ended up stuck in a confined space with someone who is completely armed and who would then be able to force me to my room out of sight of anyone else to rob me or God knows what. So I announced, I can't believe I lost my key. Sorry for the holdup. And bolt out towards the front desk, which is currently unoccupied. As I'm waiting for someone to come out, I notice this man has stepped back off the elevator, walking out of the hotel and was smoking a cigarette just outside the revolving door possibly waiting to see if I get back into the elevator. When the clerk came out, I explained what happened, and security walked me to my room. When I turned back around, he was gone. To this day, I think back on that moment. Had I been ready, with key in hand, things could have ended very badly. Had I not listened to the voice in my head, warning me to not be stupid and take the room key out of my bag, Things would have ended very badly. I listened to a crime podcast where the narrator says, Be rude, be weird, stay alive, which I find to be true. So, creepy man on the elevator, I hope I never run into you again. All right, dear listeners, this next story will be in three parts, which I will read concurrently. Here we go. So, I've never shared this story. I always keep it buried deep down until recently, but this is happening in the present. I have had people stalk and follow me before, and because of that and my true crime addiction, I've become supremely paranoid and a solid curtain twitcher. I'm 31 and reside in an upstairs room that was my first room to myself as a child. I had to leave a bad situation and therefore ended up back at my childhood home. For reference, when our house was built, we were told that the field to our left, with horses in a barn at the time, would one day soon be a development. It was 2000 when we were told that, and it wasn't until 2022 that roads started being formed and foundations laid. I've already had someone follow me home before when I was young, but I was in a different bedroom next door. My parents put in a free library that's right below my window and nighttime security lights that are very bright and turn on if you're within 20 feet from the side of my house my room is on. I'll admit, having an open field next to me so long made me accustomed to not closing the curtains when I change because there was never anyone to watch. Now, there is. For the past two weeks, the burglar lights next to the free library have been going off late at night. Because my one side of the curtain is open so I can use my vape, that's the only reason I noticed it at all. I didn't think too much of it at first. We lock all the doors and windows every night, and I'm on the second floor. I also always look out to see if it was a car, someone walking their dog, or a deer, only to see nothing. To add, they put in a shit ton of streetlights around this area, so visibility is great. But it just kept happening. So last night, I did my usual, and I saw the lights come out of my peripherals. I acted natural, 
giving a full view out the window. I was going to bed. It was about 3 a.m., turning the TV off, closing the window and curtains, and then turning out the light. Then, I dug down, peering through the curtains to the sidewalk below. I honestly thought I was going to pass out when after a few minutes, maybe five, someone comes out of the side of my house all silhouette, dressed in black. They keep their back to me until the light turned off, but I swear I could still see them standing there, looking up like they could see me. I called the police, but while I was on the phone with the operator, I saw him run off. There wasn't much they could do, except say they'd have a car drive around and, you know, take a look. My parents are asleep, and I know I have to tell them tomorrow. This scares the crap out of me. If it hadn't been happening for weeks and was a solo incident, I would probably be fine about it, but the fact that the light had been going off without me seeing activity and what happened tonight makes me think this person has been watching me and watching my house. To the person outside my window, let's please never fucking meet. Here's a small update. I did tell my parents, and at first they brushed it off, claiming I had a couple of drinks and it was too late. So, I probably just saw something checking out the library. I then had another conversation about it with my dad, who said that there had been reports the last couple of weeks of car break-ins, and since my car is parked on the side of the street, right outside my window, maybe they were trying to break into it. I pointed out that if he was trying to get into my car, why was he pressed up against the house where he wasn't visible from my window? And why did he at no point go towards my car? I think I freaked him out enough that we were going to potentially get a camera for that area. Given all the development happening around us, I think it's smart, even without this incident. There hasn't been any activity since the night after I originally posted the first part. I was on a phone call the very next night with a friend when I noticed something standing outside, completely shrouded in darkness. I proceeded to talk loudly about how some creep was watching me and they'd better watch out. Stupid? Yeah, I know. But it seemed to work because all was quiet after that. Or so I thought. Tonight was one of my closest friends last night in town, so I was out till about 9.30 p.m., drove two friends home, and then myself. Since it was too early, I wasn't that worried, but still alert. I drove up the side of the street he hid on last time, even though it was out of my way, and I saw nothing out of the ordinary. I noticed one of the new houses that's being built had its lights on, which I don't think much of it in the moment. Fast forward an hour, and I start hearing a weird loud banging sound across the way. I know it's risky, but I'm not letting some asshole dictate my comfort. And I've also been watching for activity and pretending so I can maybe catch them. So I've kept my window open as usual. Hence why it was dumb to razz him the other night by talking about someone watching me. But I digress. It stopped. So I wrote it off. Big mistake. Shortly after, I started hearing banging again. But this time, I could actually feel it. It was coming from my house. I genuinely freaked out, like knives out status, but much more cowardly, carrying in my bedroom floor with my ear pressed to the door and knife in hand. It was a strange hollow sound that didn't seem like the front door. It wasn't. I once again called 911, describing what's happening and thinking they probably are going to write it off before I sounded crazy. I still feel in shock because this only just happened. 
Thankfully, the kind dude on the line definitely took me seriously and said someone would be on their way. For the record, the police department's like a three-minute drive from my house. I ended up tiptoeing downstairs to see, and once again felt my heart stop. I went to the front window, dug down, and there wasn't anyone at the front door. Then the banging starts again, and I can tell how close it is. I go to the side of the window that overlooks the garage, and that's when I saw him, dressed in black, hood pulled over his face, banging wildly on the garage with a fucking crowbar. I honestly don't know why he wasn't using the crowbar to break in, but I'm super glad he didn't, as the door inside the garage that leads into the house is always left unlocked. To say I panicked is a vast understatement. I nearly pissed myself, which is, I think, understandable. I'm just standing there, peeking out of the window, watching this guy wail on my garage door with a crowbar, thinking how fucking unhinged he must be and how much I want the cops to get there now, when, just like before, he runs off. I quite literally just got done giving a report to the cops that showed up. My family was woken up and had to talk to them as well, as they're the homeowners and now they're both so freaked out that my dad just ordered four exterior cameras to monitor the house. I don't think it's over yet. This man has some reason he's targeting my house, possibly me since he started out by watching me outside my window. So, to this man, you'd better hope we never meet. I got a crowbar, too. So, I'm not even sure if this is relevant for the past two stories about the person watching through my window and banging on the garage with a crowbar, but I'm worried that everything may be connected somehow. A week ago from... This last Saturday, I was supposed to meet with a man who had contacted me through social media with friends in common. It wasn't an obvious date, more like a pre-date. We didn't get there, though, as he randomly blocked me out of nowhere and then unblocked and apologized, thinking everything was normal and we were hanging out. When I didn't respond at all, seeing some major red flags in his behavior... He reached out to tell me I had thin skin for not just going along with it and meeting him in a debately isolated place. I brushed it off, only to get a message from a different man, seemingly unconnected, blatantly asking me for a date exactly a week later. I asked him up front, and kind of rudely, why he reached out and wanted to date me but he was seemingly unfazed. We seemed to have a lot in common and were supposed to meet tonight. Here's where it gets weird. I asked him if we should meet at six in a particular spot. He saw it but said nothing. I figured since he was at work, he was busy, but then nothing all day. And when I checked it again, he saw it after we were supposed to meet and still nothing. He pursued me, just as the last guy, but this time made me more nervous because it feels like he wanted to make sure I was at a certain place at a certain time. For the record, it is a public place, and also very dark in the parking lot and somewhat rural. I didn't think much of that at first, as it's a place I've gone all of my life but it feels like something is going on here. These two men were not reaching out through a dating app. I'm not on anyway, yet as I wasn't sure about being ready to date again and wanted to let things happen or not happen organically, they found me through social media. Maybe it's not connected, but commenters on the other posts pointed out how easy it is to find someone's address through social, and these last two men reaching out in such a way, acting in such a way, in so close a time makes me wonder. Maybe my window-watching garage door banger is separate, 
hell. Maybe even those are two separate people. I'm not sure what's scarier, but I'm thinking it's scarier if all of this is somehow connected, as my gut tells me. I just don't believe in coincidences, and all of these things happening at the same time is so suspicious to me. I'll continue going to my gun handling safety courses, and I start Maui Thai next month, so there is that. Hope this wasn't a horrible update, I just really felt a bad feeling about these two guys, and even if they aren't connected, I hope we don't meet. Oh yeah, I forgot. I forgot to add that as many helpful and worried commenters suggested, we had added four exterior cameras. Bad news, if you didn't see it, one of my comments on the previous post, my mom lost her keys. They have an air tag. Police have made several attempts to retrieve them, unsuccessfully. We don't always know the location. We have all been keeping bedroom doors locked, and there are no extra keys in the main area to all the bedrooms, but it's still very scary. Having the whole house rekeyed, and my mom had been using my dad's car since she goes to the neighborhood that they're in work for. So yay, on top of these weird anxiety-inducing incidents, someone out there also has keys to my house. This seems kind of surreal to me, but here's an experience I just recently had. It was a Friday night and I had gone to bed early, as I had work on Saturday morning. After reading in bed for a bit, I drifted off at around 10.30pm, only to wake up an hour later to loud screams and people yelling profanities. I thought my girlfriend was watching a movie with the volume way up and I went out into the lounge room to ask her to turn it down a little. Instead, the TV was off, and my girlfriend was staring at the front door with her eyes wide open. Our apartment is on the ground floor of the building, and so our front door opens directly out into the lobby of the building. The voices in question were coming directly from the lobby. I could not make out specifics, in my defense, I was half asleep in the language of the country I live in is not my first language. But there was a lot of swearing involved. My first thought was that it was some kind of domestic dispute. But after listening, I realized it was a group of men that sounded extremely aggressive. I looked at the WhatsApp group chat for my apartment building and to my horror saw a message from one of the people in it that there were armed men in the building and that we should not leave our flats. The country I live in is experiencing a marked uptick in crime and I had heard stories of armed groups of men robbing entire apartment blocks. But this had seemed fairly apocryphal to me. However, that was my first thought, that these men would kick down our door and rob us one of my dogs started to growl at the commotion outside. I shushed him, and thankfully he obeyed. I heard a commotion in the apartment above me and went out to my patio to see what was happening. I heard what sounded like a large piece of furniture being knocked over, and the women and children screaming in terror. At this point, I had no idea what was going on, but I knew that by now, they would have robbed us already, if that is what they had planned to do. My girlfriend and I decided to hide in a small shed at the end of our patio, monitoring the group chat on our phones. Our bigger dog silently stood watch outside the door of the shed, his eyes locked on the sliding door at the end of the patio. I would find my smaller dog later, cowering between the washing machine and the dryer. After 10 extremely tense minutes, 
I heard the screeching of tires, signaling what I hoped was the perpetrator's fling scene. Eventually, someone in the group chat said the police had arrived, and breathing a sigh of relief, I came out of hiding and opened the front door. Alarmingly, on the floor of the lobby, there were zip ties that had been cut and the security guard was talking to one of the tenants. The man was bleeding from a large gash on his face and looked extremely shaken. Over the next few hours, the story would unfold. The man I saw with the gash on his face was the tenant in the upstairs apartment, the one I had heard the commotion coming from. He was the owner of an import-export business and, for whatever reason, had a sizable sum of money and cash hidden in his apartment. Someone had obviously found out about it and planned out the robbery that woke me from my sleep on a Friday night. A group of eight men had followed him into the apartment building's garage and ambushed him as he got out of his car and, judging from the gash on his face, roughed him up a bit. Some of the group of eight had gone to the lobby, surprised the security guard, and zip-tied him. The remainder of the group had gone up to the apartment, robbed it, and then fled the scene. It is fairly chilling to think that armed men were mere meters from my front door. So, to the armed men that stormed into my apartment building to steal my neighbor's cash. I hope we never meet again. This is my first time sharing this story, so I hope I'm doing it correctly. I had multiple creepy encounters in my life, and I'm sure I'll post another. But this one was by far the creepiest. It happened several years ago when I was 17. I'm 22 now. At the time, I lived in a suburban neighborhood with my mother, who was rarely home. And I worked part-time after school and weekends at a diner. At first, we had quite a few regulars that, you guessed it, came in regularly. But... There was this one guy in particular that was different from the rest. He was young, late 20s at the most, tall, lanky, and had a voice, I hate to describe it this way, that seemed very feminine. His name was Mike, and he recently had started coming in every Tuesday night. It only took a couple of weeks for me to become friends with Mike. He was friendly, hilarious, and I thought he was quite eccentric, as am I. So we got along really well. There were a few things that struck me as odd. Firstly, he was always making up these stories about himself that were difficult to believe. Secondly, he would come into the diner in the late afternoon and stay there with us until we were turning the lights off. Sometimes I wouldn't get off until 11 p.m. or so, when my entire town was basically shut down and dark. I put all of my suspicions away at the time, because Mike was a super cool dude. It all got weird when I got my first iPhone. Mike was showing me how to do everything, how to save numbers, make calls, how to download apps. He even downloaded a few for me to get me started. I thought nothing of it, and then he started to text me like crazy. It was all normal stuff at first. He would text about the weather, about his favorite TV shows, and then he started to send me his photography photos that he said he took of a best friend. I got a little weirded out at that point because the photos weren't ones he'd taken. They were very obviously pictures that were saved from the internet, not to mention the backdrop for his best friend was unrealistic for the area we lived in. I believe I texted him something along the lines of, You didn't take those photos? LOL. And that's when he started to flip out on me. He started calling me all sorts of awful names and started to cuss at me and told me, 
that I was the untrustworthy one, not him. I was so baffled, I decided to just not text him back and talk to him about what went on the following week on Tuesday when he came in. Well, he ended up coming in the next night. I figured he was going to because a server had told me he called the restaurant around lunchtime to see if I would be working that night. He apologized and told me he was out of line and we moved on. After a seemingly normal evening with him at the diner, I decided to ask Mike if he was single because I had this awesome friend, Anthony, that I thought he should meet. I was under the impression that he was gay because of the way he talked about his exes and whatnot. They sounded like they were dudes. Mike immediately flipped out on me again. I'm not gay. I like women. Why does everyone think I'm gay? I completely froze. I was so upset with myself that I would falsely assume something so private, and I felt so guilty. Mike had already stormed out, but I texted him shortly after, telling him how sorry I was. That evening, as I was laying in bed reading a magazine, I get a response from Mike. The text simply read, Where are you? I didn't know how to respond without A, revealing I was alone in my house, and B, giving him reason to try and come over to my house. So I didn't respond. I was hoping to play it off in the morning, like I fell asleep. He then texted me again, saying, Never mind, you're at home. I immediately called my boyfriend at the time and asked him if he would come over and stay the night with me which he promptly did. I didn't tell him why I needed him to come over, and I didn't tell him that I had a creepy stalker either. I blocked Mike's number the next day. I asked my manager not to let anyone give out my personal schedule to anyone who asked or called, and I stopped working Tuesdays. About a week went by before I had a weird, unsaved number text me. You're mine. I don't care about your boyfriend. It took me less than 0.5 seconds to realize that Mike had made a new number to talk to me. He started to flood my phone with derogatory comments about me, graphic stories he made up of us in his mind, and his desire for me to break up with my boyfriend. He basically went to stalker level 600 and I noped the situation super hard. I blocked that number and switched to weekend day shifts only. I told my boyfriend about the situation, and he started to stay with me regularly. I thought I'd taken care of the situation until I started to see Mike in random places. I would see him just driving out of the parking lot after I'd gotten off work. I would see him driving in the distance while I was getting gas. Everywhere I looked, it looked like he was there, too. Of course, I rolled it off as paranoia. One night, I was home alone, waiting for my boyfriend to get off work and come stay with me. I got a text from an unsaved number that read, Hey stranger, you home? I then got a few more that led me to believe he was there, too. I ever so sneakily peeked through the curtains in my main hallway to see Mike's car parked outside my house. I started to psycho-dial my boyfriend until I realized he was pulling up in the driveway passing Mike on the street. I took my phone to my carrier and had them give me a new number and make it so no unsaved numbers could text me. The guy who was helping me asked me if I also wanted to deactivate the GPS tracker that was set on my phone. I was completely dumbfounded that Mike had downloaded an app that traced my every move. I could see Mike on the map too, and he had refreshed my location just 14 minutes ago. I took a mini leave from work until I finished my semester 
and the manager at work handled talking to Mike. My mother and I moved into an apartment on the other side of town that summer. One of my biggest fears is that he never stopped following me, and I just don't know about it yet. Creepy Creeper Mike, please let's not ever meet again, and I do mean ever meet again. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these true Let's Not Meet stories. Before I go on further, I would like to give a very special shout out to the elite members of Back to Ashes. Nate Davies, Dova Khaleesi, Edith Smith, Tammy Slayton, Luz Crispin, Colt Stonewolf, Denise Sess, Samantha Place, Stephanie McLaren, Corpse Lover, Normie D.W., Cindy Cleveland, and Patty's Knees. Thank each and every last one of you for your continued support for Back to Ashes. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you're awake, I hope you've enjoyed this collection. Until next time, please take care of yourselves. I'll be reading to you soon. Peace, love, and light to you all.